Well, we're glad you came this morning. We're glad you got breakfast. And uh, we hope you enjoyed it. And uh, my wife, bless her heart, she was just worried to death. She wouldn't get the biscuits in the oven in time. But we made it, and uh, everything was good. I tell you what, uh, if you would, uh, you know, I know some of you don't know the difference between here Bethel people and out yonder Bethel people, okay? But if you see somebody here that you know is from Bethel, and they have put a lot of work into this thing, shake their hand, give them a hug, tell them you appreciate it, and uh, just make them feel good, all right? And uh, I, I appreciate this church and all the work and the labor that they put into it. Bless their heart. We put up the uh, outside pavilions. I say we. I sat in my office while they put up the outside pavilions. And uh, I'm not allowed to pick anything up. And if I pick something up, my wife says, how heavy is that? I said, it's 10 to 15 pounds, because that's what I'm allowed to pick up. No matter what it is, it's 10 to 15 pounds. But anyway, they set that thing up. We pulled in here yesterday morning, and the front one was just crashed. All the metal was bent on it. The fabric was ripped. And uh, it was some kind of storm that moved through between 6.30 and 7 o'clock and just <laughs> destroyed it. And uh, so fortunately, Kmart had a replacement. Waiting on the shelf, all lonely. So we picked it up, and they set it back up, and we appreciate that. Take your Bible, turn to 1 Thessalonians 5, and then we'll go to the Lord in prayer. Um, a lot of times when, I, when we have homecoming, I like to kind of split it up and have a bunch of different topics we're going to talk about. And this year I just uh, felt like maybe dealing with one or two things and just do that throughout the day. And so that's what we're going to do. We're going to talk about the day of the Lord. Um, I thought uh, coming into this week that maybe this afternoon we would have a question and answer. And lo and behold, Sister Nanine from Florida, she came to me last night and she said, I have an idea. I said, what is it? She said, let's do a Q&A. And I went, yeah. <laughs> So anyway, uh, here's what I'm going to ask you to do, okay? If you have a question uh, from anything related to the Bible, prophecy, or anything like that, write it down, okay? And um, hand it to me, okay? Uh, or anybody from this church and say, I can't find Pastor Mike, but here, give this. Or if you want to, my office is right here. It's where that great, big, huge monster buck is, hanging on the wall. Okay? Huge monster. Don't laugh at my dear. Where's yours? The zoo. I was thinking you were going to say, sitting next to you. That's your deer, right? There you go. Uh, so anyway, you can just lay it on my desk. Okay, maybe put your name on it or whatever, and any kind of question like that. So maybe we'll get time to do that this afternoon, all right? 1 Thessalonians 5, let's go to the Lord in prayer, and uh, let's tell God thank you for the good food and the sweet fellowship. Isn't this great? Can you imagine heaven? None of us will be ugly then, right? We'll all be beautiful and radiant and glowing and don't need coffee to get that way. Amen. So uh, th this is just a little foretaste of what heaven's like. And I'm excited about that. Amen. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this gorgeous day. Lord, this is not like August in this area, and you know that. Lord, you just brought us pretty weather. And you brought in some wonderful people, literally, Lord, from the four corners of the earth. And, Father, we thank you for that. It has been good for us to fellowship with them throughout the week. It's good to see familiar faces. It's good, Lord, to see brand new faces. And, Father, we just thank you for that. We thank you for giving us this weekend a little bit of what heaven is going to be like. And, Lord, if it's... If it's anywhere near 
what we are experiencing this weekend, Father, everything that we go through in life will be worth it for what you've done. The work and the labor that our good people in this church have put together, Father, you've blessed it. And I pray, Lord, that you would bless them. Bless these that have traveled, in some cases, many thousands of miles to be here. They've sacrificed. They've taken time out of their lives. And they've traveled here. You brought them here. And Lord, I pray, dear God, that you would just watch over us. That you would give us grace. That you would give us mercy. Father, that you would help us, Lord, to be thrilled at what's in your word. And the things, Father, that you're going to teach us. And Lord, I know, beyond any doubt, that I have nothing to give these weary travelers for their journey in life. And sometimes, Father, I know they're probably just like me. Sometimes we're not sure if we're even going to make it. So, Lord, we ask you that you would rise up and that you would give us bread and give us rest for, for our journey. Lord, there are people here that have come here, Lord, because they just needed to be around like-minded people, people who love you, people who love the Word. And Father, they may have brought burdens and cares in their life. They may have been fighting battles that they never wanted to fight, but they realize that they can't just sit idly by and let things go. So Father, I pray, God, that you would give them rest from that battle, rest from the toil and the labor uh, that they have in life. And Lord, that you would just bless them tremendously. Father, bless and honor your word today. Teach us some wonderful things. Teach me, Lord, even today, some things that I don't know. Father, bless our singers. Give them, Lord, a heart full of joy. And, Lord, I pray, God, that they would minister the gospel of Jesus Christ to us today. Bless all these that have gathered with us online. And I pray, God, Lord, that you would make these meetings fruitful for your kingdom and your glory's sake. We love you and we thank you, Lord, for what we are about to receive. We give you all the praise and the glory in Jesus' name and all of God's people said. Amen. Amen. First Thessalonians chapter 5. Are you there? Amen. Let's take a look at it. I have it up on the screen and you can't read it from where you are. So open your Bible up. Amen. Amen. Uh, verse, um, I have Second Peter up there. That's not what I want, but I want to start in First Thessalonians 5. All right. But of the times and the seasons, brethren, you have no need... That I write unto you. Now what I think that means is. Paul doesn't need to address it here. Because it's addressed in many other places in the Bible. The times and the seasons. That God is going to bring about. They're written in this book. And the reason why we don't know it yet. Is we don't need to know it yet. But I think. That as that time draws near. God's going to open the eyes of his people. He's going to let us see things. He's going to let us see things that are going on in the world. He's going to let us see things that are just coming right out of this book. So they are written. And then Paul says, verse 2, For yourselves know perfectly that, and I want you to, if you underline things in your Bible, here it is, the phrase that we're going to talk about this weekend. The day of the Lord. The day of the Lord. Now what does that mean? Is it, is it speaking of a... A 24-hour day? Is it speaking of something that happens only in the daytime? Uh, or is it speaking of something else? That's what we're going to look into. For he says, Know perfectly that the day of the Lord so cometh as a thief in the night. For when they shall say, Peace and safety. And I don't know about you, but I've spent the last 40 years of my life waiting for someone to say, Peace and safety. Because then I'd go, oh, they said it. And who is they? I don't know. But it's kind of like how people talk about the Illuminati. Because when people talk about conspiracies, they always say, yeah, they're watching us. Who? They are. <laughs> they tapped into our cell phone. They've tried to kill me three times. Who? They. Okay. So whoever they are, they're going to say peace and safety. When they say that, and what that is, I mean, it's easy to understand at least the, the simplistic part of it is 
People are going to be lulled into a false sense of security. And they're going to think, Everything's cool now. Everything's right. Everything is going to be awesome. We're in a new age of peace and harmony and marijuana. Okay? But when that happens, suddenly, who, which of our ladies here suddenly went into labor? You had that experience. You went, oh, right? Amen. My wife did. I'm in labor. Okay? And I said, sit down, the show's not over. <laughs> Peace and safety, then sudden destruction cometh upon them. The word destruction is a destroy word. It is related, I think, to Abaddon, Apollyon, the destroyer. Okay? When the destruction comes, the destruction's coming from the destroyer. Yep pictures of that all through the Bible. The angel that went through Egypt killing the firstborn. It was the destroyer. God sent the destroyer. And so sudden destruction cometh upon them as travail upon a woman with child and they shall not escape. But ye, brethren, are not in darkness. Somebody say amen. amen. That, the day, that that day should overtake you as a thief. God's going to open our eyes. God's going to turn the light on. God's going to signify to us. This is the day. This is it right here. And we will not be taken off guard. God's people will not. False brethren will. Lost people will. That day overtakes them as a thief. Now, I'm going to throw something in here. And I'm going to correct something that you may have heard or believed. Jesus is not a thief. He's not stealing us. And I've heard this nonsense about, oh, have you ever looked into the Jewish wedding ceremony? No, I'm not Jewish. Okay, didn't marry a Jew. Well, the Jewish wedding ceremony is... The bridegroom sneaks in at night and steals the bride away. And that's, that's how they do it. I don't care. Jesus is not stealing us. We're bought and paid for. The price has been paid. He has rights to us. Just like Boaz. Boaz did not steal Ruth from the house of Naomi. He did not take her without permission. He did not have the rights to have uh, Naomi's husband's inheritance. He had to purchase that from a nearer kinsman. And once he did, he then had rights to assume the role of husband to Naomi or to Ruth. And that child that was born, that first child that was born, went to the house of Naomi to restore the inheritance and the bloodline to that house, okay? That's a picture of what God is going to do. But Jesus is not stealing anything or anybody that does not rightfully belong to him. Amen? Who is the thief? He's the thief. He's the one who comes to kill and steal and, and what? Destroy. Start to make sense now, doesn't it? Okay? So he says, verse 5, um, You're all children of light, the children of the day. That's because we are conceived by the word of God, and the word is light. So we are children of the light, and the children of the day. We are not of the night, nor of darkness. So, being children of the day, we are clothed with the sun. Like in Revelation 12. And because darkness does not have dominion over us, the moon is under our feet. Because that shows anything under your feet is dominion. You own it. Okay? Or at least you can control it while your feet's on them. Okay? But you control that. You have dominion over that. In Revelation 12, that woman has the moon under her feet. She has ruled over that. Okay? Ladies. 
there is an aspect to your body that relates to the lunar cycle. Right? God's going to give you dominion over that one of these days. Here, I'm cheering for you. I'm not even a woman, all right? It's good to find that out, isn't it? Okay, so we're not of the night nor of the darkness. Therefore, let us not sleep as do others. But let us watch and stay away from Rodney Howard Brown. Do not get drunk. Physically, spiritually, do not get drunk. Watch and be sober. For they that sleep, sleep in the night, and they that be drunken are drunken in the night. But let us who are of the day be sober, putting on the breastplate of faith and love, and for an helmet, the hope of salvation, in verse 9, for God hath not appointed us to wrath. And I believe that. So whenever God begins to pour out wrath on this earth, we are not here. Amen. We are not appointed to that. We're not going to have to endure that. God's wrath is only for sinners, not for the righteous. For God has not appointed us to wrath, but to obtain salvation by our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, let's examine a few things about this phrase, the day. Of the Lord. Turn to first turn to first Peter or Second Peter chapter three. And let's read that. Second Peter chapter three, verse eight. But beloved, be not ignorant of this one thing, that one day is with the Lord as a thousand years. And a thousand years as one day. The Bible's telling you that in the way that the Bible speaks, those are interchangeable. And God can do that because he's the one who created the day. Did he not? He created the day, so he has rights to determine that a day equals 24 hours, but also a day equals a thousand years. Consider, and I've talked about this before, but consider the idea that when uh, in the book of Genesis, early on before the flood, you had men who were living 900 years, 950 years, 969 years, 900 and, how was Methuselah? 969, okay. Adam was 930 years. God told Adam in Genesis chapter 2 not to eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. He said, for the day that thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die. Well, we know that when Adam ate that fruit, he did not just fall down dead right then and there. The sun went down on him just like it had all the days before that particular day. Did God lie? Or some say, well, he died Spiritually, I don't see that in Bible. What I see is neither Adam, nor Methuselah, nor Noah, nor anybody ever lived to be 1,000 years old. Not one of them. They all died in that same day, how God designated that day. The day of the Lord is as a 1,000 years, and a 1,000 years is one day. So... We know that a day in the Bible can equal 24 hours. In Genesis chapter 1, the evening and the morning were the first day. The evening and the morning were the second day, and so on. So the Bible's telling you that it's a literal 24-hour day. But also, it is a thousand years. So when we talk about the day of the Lord, and this is where some people are not, I, I don't know, they, I, to me they, they don't get it. A day with the Lord does mean a particular Tuesday afternoon at 3 o'clock, okay? The day of the Lord is going to take place. I think it denotes a literal 24-hour day, a specific day of the week. I also believe that it denotes the entire 1,000-year reign. Because we know that Christ is going to come. He's going to put down the Antichrist. 
and he is going to initiate his reign over the earth, and that is going to last a thousand years. The Bible tells you that in two places. It's going to be a thousand years. They shall rule for a thousand years. Satan is bound for a thousand years. So there's not going to be the wars that we see now. We're not going to have to deal with North Korea. Okay? We're not going to have uh, the poverty, the famines. We're not going to have the ills of this world during that thousand years. That's amazing. Christ and his saints, the ten thousands of his saints, they're going to rule with him for a thousand years for, for that last <laughs> Sabbath day of rest. Amen? Amen. Six thousand years from Adam, roughly till somewhere around now. <laughs> and at the very beginning, Christ is going to initiate the beginning of his reign on the day of the Lord. Both of them are applied. In general, all events described fit within the 1,000 year time frame. Specifically, there are events that precede the appearance of Christ in the air. That's what I think. If we go back to 1 Thessalonians 5, let's do that. Remember what we learned last night. Uh, believe the Bible, read the Bible, meditate on the Bible. Uh, walk circumspectly around particular verses. See what comes before them, see what comes after them. If we're looking in 1 Thessalonians 5, for the times and seasons, brethren, you have no need that I write unto you, for you know, perfectly know that the day of the Lord shall come with as a thief in the night. What did he speak of prior to verse 1, chapter 5? Verse 18, chapter 4. The rapture. The translation. So is the Holy Ghost, through Paul, associating the translation with the day of the Lord? I believe he is. I believe that is well within walking circumspectly around 1 Thessalonians 5. Right before that, he's talking about the translation. Then he mentions the day of the Lord. In 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, look there, just turn the page. He mentions... In verse 1, chapter 2, the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and by our gathering together unto Him. And then he calls it, in verse 2, the day of Christ. Is the day of Christ the same as the day of the Lord? Yeah. Brandon, I agree with you. <coughs> Christ is who? The Lord. the Lord. The day of Christ, the day of God, the day of the Lord, the day of the Lord's vengeance. All of those terms, I think, apply to the same thing. Now, there are a lot of people, King James Bible believers, that would just totally disagree with me on that. I love them. I respect them. I don't have to agree with everything that somebody tells me to believe just because they say, well, that's what we teach. Fine. Amen. Okay? I don't see it that way. I see something different. Now, Second Peter, back to Second Peter. Be not ignorant, day with the Lord is as a thousand years, a thousand years is one day, verse 9. The Lord is not slack concerning his promise. Slack, uh, I think of a rope. When you pull a rope taut, you've taken up the slack. That means that when that rope is good and tight, there's no room for variableness. When you run a tape measure, you want the tape measure tight. When you're going to lay, guys, if you've ever laid out a chalk line on something, you want that chalk line tight. You don't want it loose. You don't want there to be slack in the chalk line. That's going to mess up your cut. A plumb line, by its very nature, is not slack. It is tight. It does not allow for variations. The Lord is not slack concerning His promise, as some men count, Slackness. I wear slacks. Okay? Meaning that they're not tight. Amen. You'll never see a picture of me in yoga pants. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. The 
Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness. Some people look at this Bible and they want wiggle room. They want slackness in it. And when God makes a promise that's very specific and it's very tight and it's very direct and it's very pointed, centered, straight on, parallel, perpendicular, it's everything geometrically right. That's how God's promises are. As some men count slackness, but as long suffering to, to usward, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. But the day of the Lord, there it is again, will come as a thief in the night. So, um, last night we said, when you're reading the Bible, compare Scripture with Scripture. So here you have 2 Peter chapter 3 mentions, number one, the day of the Lord, and it mentions as a thief in the night. That then you can compare with 1 Thessalonians 5, because it mentions the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night. Both of them mention the same thing. So what you can do is, you, if you have a little notebook or you make notes in your Bible, right next to... 2 Peter chapter 3, where it says that come to the thief of the night, maybe make a little note that says, 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 says the same thing. So what's happening here? God has given you part of his teaching in 1 Thessalonians 5. He's given you another part of his teaching and understanding in 2 Peter chapter 3. So that when you read both verses, you're getting more of the details of the day of the Lord that if you just isolated one and said, well, Peter wrote to different people, so therefore Peter's day of the Lord is different than Paul's day of the Lord. The Bible doesn't say that. It's the day of the Lord. Amen. Amen. All right. So, the day of the Lord will come as the thief in the night in which the heavens shall pass away with a great noise and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. Now... When the Lord appears in the air and translates us into heaven, Dave Bradley, he's not going to melt the earth right then and there, is he? This is what would lead some people to be post-millennial. They say, well, it says right here, the day of the Lord, he's going to melt the heavens and the earth with a fervent heat. And that's when the new heavens and new earth comes in. So obviously, the Lord's not going to take us in, into heaven until the end of the millennial reign. Because that's the day of the Lord. But remember, a day can equal a day, or it can equal a thousand years. So, at the end of the 1,000 years, we know this because Revelation tells us that specifically. That once Satan is bound, then at the end of the 1,000 years he's loosed. He goes and he gathers another army, and he tries one more time to sit on God's throne. And God just goes, Psh, in the lake of fire you go. Okay? And then he melts away the old heavens and the old earth because John said, I saw a new heaven and a new earth for the old heaven and the old earth will pass away and there was no more sea. So we know that that happens at the end of the thousand years. Is it still not the day of the Lord? It is because a day equals... A th and he just said that right there. A day equals a thousand years. So if that never made sense to you before, Okay, is, is the day of the Lord, is that when he melts everything with fervent heat or what? Just remember, it can, it can all fall within a 24-hour day or it can fall within a 1,000-year day. Does that make sense to everybody? Yeah, yeah. Okay. All right, now, verse, um, let's see here. With fervent heat, verse 10 still, the earth also and the works that are therein shall be burned up. Verse 11, seeing then that all these things shall be dissolved, what manner of persons ought ye to be in all holy conversation and godliness? Looking for and hasting unto the coming of the day of God. That's another term for the same day. It's God's day, right? The Sabbath is God's day. Okay? It's holiness unto the Lord. So he says, the coming of the day of God, wherein the heavens being on fire shall be dissolved and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. Nevertheless, we, according to his promise, look for new heavens and a new earth. Wherein dwelleth righteousness. Amen. Amen. All right. So, the day of the Lord. Up on the screen. Here's some of the things that it's associated with. Clouds and thick darkness. We're going to study that. It's accompanied or associated with Joel's army. Okay. What is Joel's army? It's associated with things falling out of the sky. 
Okay? Like E.T. <laughs> E.T. in Spielberg's movie fell right out of the sky. Starman. Science fiction movie of the 80s. This alien fell, his ship crashed, and he fell right out of the sky on the earth. Took on the form of a human being. Mated with a human woman. Gave her a child. Genesis 6. And that's what it is, okay? Uh, so things falling out of the heavens. The shaking of both the earth and the heavens associated with the day of the Lord. It is the initiation of God's wrath. This is when God is, he's done, he's going to pour it out, it's over with. And then it's associated with the glorious appearing of Jesus Christ. Two different things that Jesus does. One is that he appears in the clouds and we are caught up to meet him and so shall we ever be with the Lord. But then in Revelation 19, he comes down from heaven with us following him, ten thousands of his saints, all riding on white horses. Do you know I've never ridden a horse? You don't fall off of them if you don't ride them, amen? Where's Courtney? Yeah. Courtney fell off a horse at Living Springs Camp. Yep. So anyway, uh, but I can't wait to ride that white horse behind Jesus. I always wanted to make a movie, and that movie would be Jesus on a white horse packing pistols <laughs> and a big cowboy hat and going, let's go! Giddy up! And I want to giddy up, amen? Turn to Isaiah chapter 2. Let's start there. Isaiah chapter 2. Amen. Isaiah chapter 2, verse 10. Enter into the rock and hide thee in the dust for fear of the Lord and for the glory of His majesty. The lofty looks of man shall be humble and the haughtiness of men shall be bowed down and the Lord alone shall be exalted in that day. Amen. Not Kim Jong-un. That little porky pig. I don't like that guy. I don't like him. Okay? He is arrogant. He is, he's following along in the footsteps of his father and his grandfather. And the North Koreans are forced to obey him as God. He is the sun god to those people. They deify him. They do what he says. Or he has them killed. It's that simple. Or he does worse than that. If you go against the state in North Korea, if they let you live, they not only send you to a work camp, but they send your wife, your children, your grandchildren, and people related to you all have to go and pay for your crimes because they have to suffer with you. He wants to stop anybody from defecting, from turning against the state. He's very cocky, he's very proud, he's very arrogant, and he's very haughty. And he thinks that he can control the world. And God is going to say, not today. Amen. I'm going to put you down. Okay? Verse 12, for the day of the Lord of hosts shall be upon everyone that is proud and lofty, and upon everyone that is lifted up, and he shall be brought low. Can I get an amen from people that America needs to be brought low? Amen. We do. I love America. But we're too arrogant. We're too cocky. We're too haughty. We think that we can just turn the world in our favor. We think that we can do anything we want. We think that men should be able to go into women's bathrooms. Yeah. Vice versa. And that the sodomite teachers at the elementary school are no threat to your children. They are. Very dangerous. We have gay pride parades. 
For people flaunt their sin as Sodom, they hide it not. And I love this country and I want this country to do well. But I know for a fact that God has to crush and destroy before he can rebuild. When you have revival in your personal life, God has to bring destruction first. Amen? Amen. That's what he's going to do. Before Christ can reign, he has to put down all of those who would be in opposition to him. So that's what he's doing. So the day of the Lord of hosts shall be upon everyone that is proud and lofty and upon everyone that is lifted up. Um, and he shall be brought low. And upon all the cedars of Lebanon that are high and lifted up and upon all the oaks of Bashan and upon all the high mountains and upon all the hills that are lifted up and upon every high tower and upon every fenced wall and upon all the ships of Tarshish and upon all pleasant pictures and the loftiness of man shall be bowed down and the haughtiness of men shall be made low and the Lord alone shall be exalted in that day. And the idols he shall utterly abolish. Take a look up on the screen. Christ is going to do away with these abominations. The Kaaba in Mecca is an idol. They bow to it. They pray to it. They worship it. It doesn't matter where you are in the world. If you're a Muslim, five times a day you find out where Mecca is you face it and you bow down toward it. It's idol worship. And God's going to put it down. Buddhism. Buddhism is making great inroads into the United States of America. That used to be a Christian nation. Buddhism is moving in secretly, privately, in, in different ways. Yoga. Yeah. Which you ought not do. Listen, if you want to stretch, get up and stretch. Okay? You want to exercise, get you some firewood. And an axe and a split maul and go out and exercise. Amen. Amen. Okay? But don't do yoga. Okay? Stay away. That's idol worship. The Virgin Mary sitting on the Ark of the Covenant. That's a Polish Catholic church in Chicago. And Mary sits right on top of God's throne. It's an abomination. The Jews bowing to a wall. Their God is that wall. They shove their little prayers in the cracks. They bow to it. They say prayers to it. It's idolatry. Incidentally, Jesus said, Matthew 24, see these buildings here? Not one stone is going to be left on another. And they all were torn down in A.D. 70 with the exception of this one wall. And they're bowing to it, which tells me God's going to tear down that wall. He's going to do it very suddenly, instantly. He's going to destroy the Jews' ability to practice their old religion. Because it was done away at Calvary. Amen? God's going to destroy every one of these. Okay? So he now notice, I'm going to go back to Isaiah 2 very quickly. And then we're going to go to Revelation. But he said, Enter into the rock, hide thee in the dust, for fear of the Lord and for the glory of his majesty. Of his majesty. Mankind exalts himself, but when he sees the Lord, and he sees the day of the Lord coming, he hides himself from God. What did... Adam and Eve do the moment they realized they were sinned. They covered themselves uh, and they went hidden. Because God walked through the garden and said, where art thou? They hid themselves. They were ashamed of what they'd done. They were ashamed of their nakedness and they went and hid themselves from the presence of God. Turn to Revelation chapter 6. While you're doing that, I'll read Isaiah chapter 2. The Bible says, and they shall go into the holes of the rocks and into the caves of the earth. For fear of the Lord, for the glory of His majesty, when He ariseth to shake terribly the earth. Verse 21, they go into the clefts of the rocks, into the tops of the ragged rocks, for fear of the Lord and for the glory of His majesty. That's what it said uh, back here in Isaiah chapter 2, associated with the day of the Lord. It was the glory of His majesty. So, in verse 21 again, uh, when He ariseth to shake terribly the earth. That is Revelation 6. That is the opening of the sixth seal. 
Because he says, the kings of the earth and the great men and the rich men and the chief captains and the mighty men and every bondman and every free man hid themselves in the dens and in the rocks of the mountain. Something is going to happen. That sixth seal is going to be opened up and God is going to shake terribly the earth and mankind is going to get an opportunity to test out his bunker that he made. Right? Rich men, rich men all over the world right now are spending millions and millions of dollars building glamorous bunkers. Bunkers with underground swimming pools and wine cellars and party atmosphere type things. They're spending tons of money on these things and they have these very wealthy people all have bug out plans where when stuff starts happening, they get taken to the airport, the private jet takes them to their bug out bunker and they go hide down in a, in a hole in the ground until the all clear signal's given. I hope they got a thousand years worth of food because they're gonna need it. You know what I think? I think it's possible the glory of the Lord's gonna shine so brightly it'll just shine right into those holes and those caves. Yeah. There is nowhere. You ask Jonah, is there a place to hide from God? There is no place to hide from God. When we come back from our break, we're going to study the, the woman that's going to have a baby. The travailing woman. Amen?